Um, so again, welcome to um, edition number two of the machine learning uh, workshop. Uh, we're going to have a total of, of four modules that we're going to be presenting. Um, some of it's going to be pretty heavy uh, for you. Um, and I think it'll be important, um, obviously, to have some breaks. Um, certainly feel free to ask questions uh, through Slack. Um, because of the amount of material that we're going to go through, um, we'll try and save uh, the verbal questions for the end of the lectures. Normally, if we were doing this live, uh, I'd be quite content for people to interrupt. Um, but we found that just because of uh, the, the conditions with Zoom, it, it's kind of hard to do um, as, uh, I guess, an interactive interaction as, as I'd really like. Um, so uh, Francis has already talked to you a little bit about the Creative Commons. These are the same slides I'll show for every beginning um, section of, of the different modules that we'll present today. So this is really just the first part, an introduction to machine learning. Um, it's kind of getting you acquainted with what we'll be doing with our lecture style, with the kinds of slides we'll be using. Um, the image on the left, um, at first I thought it was actually some kind of um, jellyfish, but I, I guess um, <laughs> um, that's a brain um, thinking. Um, so the structure for today is, um, um, modules, four modules today, four modules tomorrow. Um, we're going to get into the guts of, of machine learning uh, for most of today. Some of you might find it a little tough going, um, but hopefully by tomorrow things will be a little easier. Um, so this is an introduction that will be kind of light. Uh, we'll probably finish a little earlier and so we may shift our schedule a little bit to give us some time towards the end of the day uh, where we're kind of short. Um, we'll try and stick to our times as best as we can. Um, and as we talked about before, the asking questions, uh, try and use Slack um, and the TAs will be able to answer things. Obviously, if there's something strange that's happening where I'm frozen or slides are frozen or something, um, hopefully you guys can communicate um, via just shouting. Um, we will have um, breakout rooms as, as uh, Francis talked about, and so this will allow people with similar questions or similar challenges to work with the TAs one on one or one on three, one on four. Um, the course has actually been developed over two years. There's a lot of uh, code development we had to do with this. Uh, you guys will find that we have both Python code as well as R. The R code has been added this year. Uh, in total, we've been working on this uh, course for about two years. While there's certainly some excellent books and there's tools like Code Academy for teaching you certain elements of um, machine learning or programming, the stuff we're going to present to you today, I think, is, is very much aligned with what we do in biology and bioinformatics. Uh, it's certainly looking under the hood and hopefully giving you some insights. Uh, so that you can understand a little bit more if you want to venture off and do um, some programming and development. Um, the people who've been developing a lot of the code uh, for the last eight months are Life and Louisa. Uh, I know everyone would prefer to pronounce Life's name as Leaf, um, but uh, it's actually Life. Um, the, uh, they'll have lots of um, answers for you. They, they, they know the code inside out much better than I do. Um, so they're great experts to have for this. So I know people have signed up for this course where we actually, I think, have more than 60 applicants for this. So the 30 of you who joined us today are, are a select group. Um, certainly machine learning is hot, but I think it's also important to sort of temper your expectations. Um, you're not going to be experts uh, in machine learning at the end of the day. We're not going to cover everything in machine learning. It's typically a topic that takes um, very skilled computing scientists multiple years to really get um, uh, familiar with. So we're trying to do something in two days um, that uh, typically people will take uh, four to six years of their lives to, to, to learn. We're going to look into, at least for today, the first module is to look at, at differentiating machine learning from conventional computing and from artificial intelligence. I'm going to show you some everyday examples of machine learning. Uh, I think you'll be surprised to see how, how ubiquitous it is. 
Uh, we're going to look at a few examples of machine learning in bioinformatics and genomics. Then we're going to talk about the standard machine learning workflow. And if that's the only thing you get from this course, then that's what I'd hope you concentrate on. It's, it's fairly simple. Um, and then hopefully if people have done um, the advanced pre-reading uh, and taken some of the uh, recommended material, look through it, um, we won't really go through the CoLab and class website and code repository. We'll assume you've done that. Um, we may have a, a question at the very end of my first module just to find out how many of you have actually been able to get through some of the pre-reading material. Um, so as I said, machine learning is widely used. Um, it's a difficult subject, and I said, even for people with backgrounds in math and computing science, it often takes them four to six years to become really experts. Um, so we're just trying to give you a taste of machine learning and hopefully inspire you to learn more on your own by giving you all of the code um, it's been written both in Python and R, those of you who are somewhat familiar with coding would be and should be able to reuse this. And we're hoping that can be, I think, part of the inspiration for this course. So we've chosen Python in part because historically a lot of um, um, freeware, collaboratory with software was written in Python for machine learning. Um, but we also have R code and we know a, a large number of people in bioinformatics use R and are comfortable in R. So this course is bilingual if you want, um, but we will be um, mostly working on Python. Um, and then if you want to go to R, um, the code is there and you can compare one-on-one um, -on -one. and this way, some people might be able to, to learn Python uh, by knowing R and vice versa. Um, one of the things that by using the CoLab environment, uh, you don't have to install Python or Python environment, the same thing with, with R, uh, you're using it through the CoLab environment. So just some definitions, um, learning versus machine learning. Um, learning is something that we all do, this is what we're going to be doing today. Um, so we are organisms, um, and what we're going to hopefully do after this two-day course is we're going to improve our uh, performance in partly coding and perhaps in understanding machine learning by going through experiences, by both listening to the lectures and by doing some class. Now machine learning is different. Um, it's not done by living systems, it's done by computers. It's a branch, a subdiscipline of artificial intelligence or AI, and essentially what happens is a computer automatically improves its performance from experience. In essence, the computer develops programs. Uh, it writes its own programs that can be used to make predictions or decisions. And the neat thing about machine learning is you're not coding it explicitly to make those predictions or decisions. Uh, you're building a framework that allows it to do or to generalize and to make predictions and decisions. And that's, I think, what's really special. Now, machine learning is almost as old as computing. Um, Art Samuel uh, was the guy who actually defined it in 1956, which is only about 10 years after the first computers started appearing. Um, anyways, it's, he defined it as a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being programmed. And that definition is still used today. So to distinguish machine learning from traditional computer programming, um, which is what many of you have done or some of you have done, what a computer is, is just a, a glorified calculator. It takes some input, it could be sets of numbers or sets of text. It runs those inputs through a program where there's addition or subtraction or division or comparison, and then it produces some output. So key for traditional computing, traditional programming is that there is a defined program. In machine learning, what we do is we provide not only input, but we also provide output. So we provide the question and we provide the answer. And by providing both of those in multiple instances, the computer is then essentially acting as a learner. Uh, if you want to think of it, it's your brain. But in this case, this is, this is taking the examples, learning from experience, seeing the input, seeing the output, looking for patterns. And then instead of kicking out an output, the learner kicks out a program. That program can be reused over and over again uh, with different types of input. 
and presumably it's now able to do or have learned uh, whatever skills it needs. So that's, that's a fundamental difference between programming and machine learning. So a little more explicit example, as I said, uh, typically a computer is a glorified calculator. So it can take one plus one and it can run it through the adder program that's found in every calculator and every computer. And it'll tell you the answer, which is two. Now in machine learning, what we would do is we give it lots of examples. So on the bottom, you can see uh, sort of an addition table, one plus zero equals one, one plus two equals three, two plus six equals eight. These are all examples. And so that's both the input, that's addition, the output is the answer. And the learner, the model, learns a concept of addition and it produces essentially a model for addition. So now we have a computer that can perform addition, but it, it didn't, it wasn't explicitly programmed to do it. It just simply learned through the experience or observation of those examples on the left. Now, another example where machine learning really shines is in character recognition or image recognition. On the left, uh, we have um, four different ways that people write the number two. Um, most of them I think are by physicians because doctors have terrible handwriting, but this is an example of, of where if you tried to put something like the word, the number two into a computer program, it would have no idea what to do. Um, programs, traditional programs are terrible at recognizing images or patterns. But by giving, uh, in this case, the input, which is a person's writing or multiple people writing the number two, and then telling it that this is the number two and learning from those examples, then you've developed an image recognition learner, um, which recognizes the number two in just about any style or any way that someone could write it. And again, that's a, a powerful approach that machine learning uh, offers and, and one of its real strengths. So for comparing machine learning to conventional computing, what the conventional computers do is that they do tedious tasks faster and they do them more accurately. And that's why we like to use computers a lot. Um, they're great for calculation, adding, subtracting. They're great for spell checking, where essentially the computer looks up um, a word and compares the word to a table of known correctly spell words. So that's uh, a simple, um, calculation or comparison that conventional computing can do. Now, machine learning will typically do things that are much more difficult than the tedious tasks or things that are not possible with conventional computer. So while spell checking can be done with almost any computer program, grammar checking is a much more difficult process. And so grammar checks that you might have on your computer uh, represent an element of machine learning. Uh, recognizing images, interpreting speech through Alexa or Siri or other um, language recognition tools. Those are examples where machine learning shines. Now, there is a difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. AI is an older field and machine learning is considered a subfield. Both still require lots of data. Uh, some people think AI is fundamentally different than ML. I don't think so really, but anyways, that's a bit of a debate. AI emerged in the 60s with the development of expert systems where people uh, wrote down large numbers of rules, lots and lots of lookup tables and created vast tables or quantities of data. And this was used to help solve uh, chess and checkers. Um, these are sort of definable games where if you have enough data, you can beat just about any human. Um, machine learning doesn't tend to use sets of defined rules or lookup tables. It uses statistics, it uses probability, it uses optimization, and we'll see examples of these. But those probabilistic methods of, of determining or calculating or creating models, that allows you to make both predictions, and decisions, and this is why it's used in something like face recognition as opposed to playing chess or checkers. Um, many of the people who actually are in the field of machine learning are actually by training experts in AI. And so now many people in AI are comfortable doing machine learning almost all the time. 
So um, I think this is just some images to distinguish between machine learning, ML, and AI. So a ML is in terms of facial recognition, which um, you can see uh, on some uh, more advanced cell phones or cameras in the cell phones, or if you've got a computer to recognize your face when you log in. Um, AI, uh, this is an example of Deep Blue, which is a program that, that beat the world champion Gary Kasparov in chess. So this is more than 20, almost 25 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is an example that used expert rules, opening moves, if anyone saw the Queen's Gambit. Essentially what uh, Deep Blue did was, was collect all of the information about um, standard uh, chess uh, games and chess moves uh, that many experts had developed over the last century and, and it played those out and it consistently beat humans. Um, an example where AI and machine learning were sort of combined together uh, was in a Jeopardy challenge. Um, some of you might have seen this, um, some of this may be brand new to you, but essentially, um, top two human performance of, of in Jeopardy, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, played off against the computer called Watson. Watson is in the middle, uh, in case you didn't recognize it as a computer. Um, and you can see there that it's um, clobbering uh, Ken Jennings on the left and Brad Rutter on the right. Um, so what Watson did uh, was essentially became a question answering system. Uh, IBM threw almost a billion dollars into developing it. Um, so I think in the end it won a million dollars. So the payoff wasn't great. Um, a thousand people um, were uh, involved in it at different times. So it used natural language processing, though that's part of the machine learning. Um, it used a lot of information retrieval and automatic reasoning, which is a, a form of, of AI. And then it used vast collections of data, um, Wikipedia, encyclopedia, dictionaries, thesauruses, newswire articles. Um, so a huge resource of, of data to help um, figure out some of the questions that were being asked. Um, so in terms of the Jeopardy challenge, Watson did really well, but in the last 10 years, they've continued to develop Watson. And so it's now moved from the hard uh, wired computer that you saw in the picture earlier um, to the cloud. Um, and it's now able to um, see and hear and read and talk and taste and interpret and recommend. It has many functions that um, are quite exceptional um, and it's being used in a, in a variety of applications. So from a Jeopardy challenge winner to something that's very close to what um, science fiction writers would imagine as, as um, uh, a real intelligence uh, is now embedded in Watson on the cloud. Now there's also a difference between machine learning and data mining. Um, both fields do use a lot of data uh, and both can be used to predict um, in some way. Um, machine learning tries to predict uh, from known knowledge uh, data mining, mining focuses on the discovery of previously unknown knowledge. And we're not going to get into that um, in this course, um, but it, it's one of the ways that people differentiate between machine learning and data mining. Another hot area is uh, deep learning. Um, so deep learning is a subdiscipline of machine learning. And basically what deep learning uses is artificial neural networks or ANNs and um, very deep multi-layered artificial neural networks. And these are called deep neural nets. Um, essentially the deep neural nets uh, have many hidden layers to them. They mimic uh, the structure of the human brain more than traditional ANNs. And this allows them to learn much more complex patterns and to handle tougher problems. Um, they've also changed the architecture of artificial neural nets to include things like recurrent neural nets, convolutional neural nets, and deep belief nets. Um, so these ones are constantly evolving and I think the area of, of deep learning is where a lot of excitement is and where some of the most significant advances have occurred. Interestingly, um, two of the most important players in the field of deep learning are actually Canadian. Uh, Jeff Hinton is at the University of Toronto and Joshua Bengio is at the University of Montreal. Um, 
Jeff's odd, he's a little older than Joshua. Um, Joshua learned his um, his machine learning, I guess, from, from Jeff Hinton. Uh, both won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize uh, in computing, the Turing Award in 2018. Um, and they're now among the most cited scientists in the world. Now there are three different approaches to machine learning, um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, they might seem subtly different, um, but in terms of supervised learning, that's the most common. And that's sort of the example I was giving, where you're giving both inputs uh, and outputs, and the outputs are, are the gold standard truth. Um, and the point of supervised learning is to learn the rules uh, to map inputs to outputs. So learning the model of addition, learning to recognize the number two. Unsupervised learning is essentially giving you unlabeled data. So you just give it a whole stack of um, different numbers and hope that the computer can start recognizing that first that it's supposed to recognize these numbers, uh, handwritten numbers. Um, and so it's trying to find structure in the input data. So that's much more challenging, but this is also something that, that people do quite well. Um, and it's one of the areas of machine learning where there's active uh, development. Reinforcement learning um, is a variation of supervised learning. It's trying to solve a problem. Uh, you're not necessarily given the outputs, but you're given feedback to maximize the rewards. So if you want giving praise, so close but not right, getting closer, getting closer. And that's what reinforcement learning um, essentially does. So it's similar, it's, it's similar to supervised learning, but slightly different. Um, machine learning uses what we call models. And so I'll use this term and it's a formal term in machine learning. Um, and the models are things like artificial neural networks. So these are the, the tools that create or write the program. So they're the ones that take the input and the output and the model um, runs or, or, or generates the program. So the simplest models are decision trees or collections of decisions trees called random forests. Uh, the next most complicated ones are the artificial neural nets. Uh, probably the most complicated ones are hidden Markov models. Uh, relatively simple ones are genetic algorithms. Uh, support vector machines and Bayesian networks are other examples of models that uh, can be used to learn um, different properties. So applications, whether it's supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement, um, we can see them in things like self-driving cars um, to play different games, whether it's poker or now more advanced levels of chess, face recognition, fingerprint recognition, um, stock trading, spam filtering, gesture recognition, which some of you might see on, on various um, things like PlayStations, um, speech recognition, hand writing recognition, uh, analyzing uh, radar images, medical diagnostics, and then of course, why most of you are here is in the application of bioinformatics. So examples of everyday uh, machine learning are in voice recognition. So whether it's on your cell phone or whether it's on your at-home computer uh, like Alexa or Google Home, um, What's done is that when you speak, um, the analog uh, sound is converted to a, a digital um, form and that digital um, set of, of sound waves is then run through various pattern recognition and that's processed into a set of words, parsed, uh, and then Alexa or Siri asks, what can I help you with? Or it gives you your answer. Um, Typically, the best um, speech recognition tools either use hidden Markov models or deep neural nets, um, and they parse or segregate the speech. They get rid of the noise, they get, get rid of the ums and ahs, uh, the hesitations that are typically found in, in human speech, and they parse out the words. They also parse out the meaning of those words in the proper sequence. Uh, if you've ever had your credit card number uh, compromised or stolen, uh, machine learning is one of the ways that they're able to detect that. Um, and 
some of you may have even got calls when you've been traveling and they think that you're doing something unusual. So what's happening is that in credit card uh, fraud uh, detection or pre prevention, they're looking for unusual purchases at unusual locations. So they're looking or they already have a good deal of information of your habits, what you like to buy, where you like to buy. Uh, they have collections of what you have bought so they can look at historical data. Um, they'll build out pattern recognition. They'll also use information about yourself uh, to create sort of a profile. So each fraud prevention tool actually is somewhat personalized for you. So it's sort of like, you know, precision health, but precision health for your credit card. Um, so this is uh, an example of, of everyday machine learning and it's actually quite effective. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, there was a really interesting challenge uh, for Netflix. I'm sure many of you have been watching TV or videos through Netflix uh, because of COVID. Um, but Netflix has gotten so popular because it's pretty good at uh, recommending um, shows that uh, align with your interests or general viewing habits. And what Netflix did 12 years ago was offered a million dollar prize contest to see if they could come up with a program that could improve um, recognition or recommendations for users. And um, the result was that, that uh, several groups actually developed very good ones, but one was significantly better uh, and it was better than the algorithm that Netflix was using. And of course, since then they've continued to improve it. What they did was they used all of the data. Uh, they had um, these millions of subscribers, millions of ratings, millions of searches. Uh, so huge amounts of data that then could be um, mined, and patterns could be detected. And the result was um, essentially a recommender that was very accurate and is still well continually being improved upon. If you have a, a cell phone with a good camera, or if you have a conventional camera, uh, at least digital, uh, most of you have uh, tools to essentially do autofocus. And the autofocus uh, element typically recognizes faces. Uh, it recognizes eyes and nose and mouth and the elements of shadow. And so with that, it can then focus on those faces and not onto something else. Um, so face detection, uh, it's used obviously for um, things like security passes with uh, computers or in secure buildings, but it is also used in your camera. And again, it uses machine learning elements to extract the features. Uh, and it looked at many thousands or millions of faces to, to look at, at those features and identify them when the head is in different positions uh, or with people having different skin colors or skin tones. Uh, machine learning is now used for the development of autonomous self-driving vehicles. Um, it's still a hot area of research. Typically reinforcement learning is, is key for uh, the development of autonomous vehicles, but there's other things that are required. Um, path planning, knowing where to go so you don't go off the road, looking ahead, um, um, looking at uh, confusing roads. The lower right corner is an example of a pretty beat up road. Uh, it's not well marked. Um, this is not challenging for a human, but very challenging for computers. Um, now, those are examples of machine learning in, if you want, everyday life. Uh, there's lots of applications of machine learning in bioinformatics. We're going to give you some examples of machine learning to be used in things like secondary structure prediction for proteins and gene finding, uh, elements of sequence motif finding. Uh, it's also been widely used in, in SNP and GWAS analysis, disease diagnosis, um, DNA sequence, uh, spectral analysis and chem informatics, drug design, drug discovery. Um, anything where you can get large amounts of data and where the problem is really hard to calculate, uh, where conventional programs fail. Now, I've been involved in machine learning for a long, long time. Um, first paper I got involved in was back in 2004. Um, we wrote a, a review in 2006 um, called Machine Learning and Cancer Prediction and Prognosis. Um, I guess it turned out that was about five or six years ahead of its time. So no one noticed it until about uh, seven or eight years ago. And now it's um, being widely used. Um, we've applied machine learning in the areas of protein secondary structure prediction, 
um, in calculating uh, mass spectra. And interestingly, one of the very first applications in the 1960s uh, was a program called Dendril to calculate mass spectra. Um, so 50 years later, uh, we revisited that. And in fact, with the new computers and uh, new approaches to machine learning, we're actually able to essentially solve that problem. We've also applied machine learning to uh, genome-wide association studies. We were really interested in understanding a little bit about um, single nucleotide polymorphism panels um, and calculating disease risk prediction from SNPs. Unfortunately, a lot of the public SNP data doesn't have the needed information for calculating risk profiles. And so we had to figure out a way of essentially uh, regressing um, the data and using both uh, support vector machines and random forests to calculate um, multi-SNP risk scores or proc curves uh, from GWAS data. So again, an application where you can use um, machine learning to, to do what at the time seemed to be impossible. Um, machine learning has also been used in many other areas. Uh, this is an example of being able to associate, do SNP types, uh, SNP typing. Uh, looking at uh, hundreds to thousands of SNP variants uh, with hundreds of categorical phenotypes. Um, this used non-supervised uh, learning, uh, something called swarm clustering. Uh, it's a neat idea. Um, and uh, I guess is an example of how you can skin a cat in many different ways. Some of you have probably used the, the Minion Oxford Molecular Nanopore. This is a widely used technique now for sequencing bacterial genomes. Uh, these are truly sequencing on a chip. You can plug it into your laptop. On the lower right is an example of the nanopore uh, output. Um, when you have or sequencing DNA with the nanopore system, DNA is, is pumped through um, a, pot a protein motor. Uh, sort of one base at a time. And if it's configured into a membrane and an electrical output is read, you essentially detect um, changes in both the speed and the electrical signal that comes out uh, as the DNA is pumped through this, this uh, nanopore. Um, what you can see is that there's, you know, interesting patterns, uh, but those are supposed to represent A's, T's, and G's, and C's. So um, it turned out it was too hard to come up with a rational program to um, convert those outputs into base calls. And so what they had to do was use hidden Markov models and recurrent neural nets. And they trained on thousands and thousands of examples or exemplar data to actually get the sequencer to work. And as it continues to train, the performance of these uh, minion sequences actually gets better uh, month to month and year to year. Um, there are examples of deep neural nets for predicting uh, things like sequence specificities for DNA and RNA binding proteins. Historically, uh, and this was done more by conventional computing, looking at uh, position-specific scoring matrices and things like that. But with the advent of machine learning, where you've got large collections of um, um, DNA and RNA binding proteins and the sequences that they bind to, um, they've extended sort of the motif scanning to include neural nets, uh, which now are a little smarter. Uh, and by iterating and training, the, the deep bind model has become much more accurate than traditional um, sequence motif techniques. Um, deep BioSeq, another one that uses deep learning, again, convolutional neural nets to analyze RNA-seq data. Um, doesn't require sequence and sequence preprocessing, doesn't require genomic alignment, it can work directly with fast cube files. Um, and they've been able to adapt it to single cell sequencing and chip sequencing. Um, machine learning is also used in, in CRISPR target design. Uh, there's a computer company called Desktop Genetics that has been able to use uh, machine learning. Uh, again, from large collections of experimental data of things that, that work and don't work with CRISPR. Um, and the machine learning is able to essentially design better, smarter, more useful CRISPR target sequences for um, gene modification. People have 
also extended machine learning beyond sort of the molecular range of you know looking at, at sequences or RNA seq or binding, but to, in the area of health um, and particularly with cancer, and particularly with the integration of not only genetic tests that we do with um, whole genome sequencing of cancer cells, but also uh, imaging. Um, whether it could be, in this case, mammogram results, uh, genealogical data, looking at uh, patient history. And by linking to the electronic health records, genealogical data, as well as um, genomics data, they're able to come up with much more robust risk predictions with a person um, initially being diagnosed through a mammogram about whether they may have cancer or not. Um, some of you have maybe had your genome analyzed by companies like 23andMe or Ancestry.com. Uh, 23andMe is a spinoff from Google. They used um, data from about 600,000 people uh, and data that not only from the GWAS data, but information on people's body weight, lifestyle, to essentially come up with a way of predicting a person's weight. Um, and now they've not essentially what they will do in terms of whether they will gain weight, um, whether they're uh, at higher risk of gaining weight later on, and how to manage um, their uh, either their propensity for gaining weight or uh, for being underweight. Applications in tumor genomics. Again, this is something that's doing a deeper dive, especially now that we can do uh, large scale next generation sequencing, and we can look at copy number variants and uh, single nucleotide variants. This one uses random forests um, and looks at features um, um, to look at, at things ranging from strand bias to, to batch effect. And what the use of machine learning in this approach to analyzing large scale tumor uh, genetics uh, improved performance significantly over what humans could do. Other areas are not just exclusive to genetics uh, or in protein sequence analysis. Um, we often use chemistry to analyze um, blood spots for newborn screening. Um, if you're under the age of 30, you've probably had one of these tests, but you didn't know it because it happened a few hours after you're born. So typically, a heel prick is done, blood is collected, and the blood is sent into a mass spec to look for certain patterns. Um, higher abundance of phenylalanine to indicate phenylketonuria, um, higher abundance of methionine. Now, these signals are kind of noisy and using machine learning to recognize um, the signals and to measure their abundance uh, actually improve the overall performance for recognizing um, people with PKU or hypermethionemia. Tendency, there's a tendency for humans to overpredict uh, or at least uh, predict too many. So there's a number of false positives. So machine learning uh, reduced those by a significant margin. So that's sort of an introduction, if you want, to machine learning, both in terms of what it is, how we define it, its history, how it's used in everyday examples, and how it's used in um, bioinformatics. Now, this is maybe the most important slide of the day and maybe of the whole course. It's just sort of outlining the machine learning workflow and something you'll need to remember and, and need to understand. So it's six steps. The first step is really to define the problem and to come up with a suggested solution. Um, we'll explain how you choose a good machine learning program, a problem, and how you can propose a decent solution. Um, the second step is to construct your data. So machine learning needs both input and output. Um, so you have to have generally a large data set. That data set is usually pretty messy. And in the third step, you spend a fair bit of time transforming your data set. I'll explain that. That may be formatting in a way so the computer can read it, formatting in a way so that machine learning tools can read it, um, but also normalizing or scaling it. There's also an element called feature selection, which is another thing, which is to target certain types of data and discard irrelevant data. So the first three steps are really data dependent. And this is the, often where people tend to neglect uh, uh, what's needed for machine learning. 
the next part is choosing and training a model. And this is what everyone loves to do. So do you choose a, an, an artificial neural net? Do you choose an SVM? Do you do something in deep, deep learning? Uh, but once you've chosen your model, when you train it, um, so the training is, you know, providing examples of input output, but training is only um, so useful. Eventually the computer has to do a performance. It's sort of like, you know, the dress rehearsal. Uh, eventually you have to do the, the live play. So in orange, that's where you test your model um, and you check its performance. And by checking both how it performed during the training and checking how well it did during the, the live performance, um, you can assess whether it's robust or sufficiently trained or whether it needs to go back to school and retrain. But if it does really well on the test, then it passes and it's actually ready to be used in many other uh, examples. And so the last step is say, once it's passed the testing and training phase, it's graduated uh, and it's met ready to make predictions or make decisions or to model or to do regression or whatever you've decided it should do. So those are the six steps. Um, training and testing are something that I'll talk about over and over again. So when it comes to choosing a problem, step one, um, generally with machine learning, you try and do something that's sort of an unsolved problem, something that's interesting to you, to your supervisor, to your own research. Um, typically, you should try and choose a machine learning problem where it can't be solved mathematically. So don't try and use machine learning to come up with a better uh, tool for addition or subtraction that's already been solved. Um, something that is um, very difficult to do, something that requires special knowledge. So it might be that over years you've learned how to do something really, really well, but um, you can't seem to teach it to anyone else. Um, then what you might want to do is essentially try and develop a machine learning uh, tool to, to, to do what you do. And so that it, it does it either better or more efficiently or faster. Typically for machine learning, you want to have a problem that's more focused on finding a pattern or for classifying things uh, or for, in some cases, doing what we call regression or curve fitting. Um, so again, the examples I gave you from the bioinformatics um, set are, are all examples where people are trying to find patterns, better ways of classifying things. Um, in other cases, improving the regression calculation. The other thing is that in order to have a, a workable machine learning problem, you need a lot of data. You need training data or exemplar data where you have the input and the output. So someone has partially solved it or there are case examples where it's solved or where the answer is known or maybe there, um, some instrument has been able, able to measure the answer for you. So having enough data, training, testing data is, is absolutely critical. So these are the four major constraints in choosing a problem. And not every problem will, will be able to meet all four. And if you can't meet all four, then machine learning isn't the thing to use. So once you've chosen a problem, once you've kind of got an idea of, of how you think you can solve it, presumably got some training and testing data where you've got you know, the answer, uh, both the input and the output, then you construct your data. So the data uh, obviously should be reliable. Uh, you have to have a gold standard answer um, as part of your output. Typically, the data has to be labeled. So that's for supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, we can get away with unlabeled data, but our focus for today and tomorrow is supervised learning. So you can have either categorical data, so red, yellow, green, uh, nominal data, which could also be red, yellow, green, but it might be named data, uh, or numerical data, so it could be sets of numbers. And as I said, the, the labels have to be gold standard answers. They have to be correct. We have to have some kind of instrumental confirmation that this is what's really there. Um, Ideally, what you also want is, is relevant information that probably contributes to the phenomenon. So if you're trying to predict DNA binding motifs, uh, information on the phase of the moon or the astrological signs that uh, a person who was collecting the data had is probably irrelevant. 
and so this is where you need to have your insight, your knowledge about what are the most important or likely contributing features to, um, say, DNA binding. Now, this is, again, something where people have a tendency to say, you know, I've got a pile of data, it's filled many drawers in my file folder, or I've got, you know, gigabytes of data in my computer. Um, you know, here, take it and tell me the answer. Right? It's sort of like someone saying, you know, what's, what's the meaning of life? Um, the, it's, the data has to be structured, it has to have useful answers, it has to be relevant uh, to the question being asked. So when you construct your data set, you have to have a, a training data set. That's the inputs and outputs. The outputs are gold standard. A testing data set, which is also a set of inputs and outputs. Sometimes it's a portion of the training data set, so you just hide it off. And then again, many people, especially physicians uh, in the medical community, also want something called validation data, which is essentially a third data set um, that is used to show that your training and your testing was really good. Now, many people will ask me, and this is a question I've had to field for many years, is you know, what's the amount of data you need for machine learning? And there is no single right answer. It depends on the type of problem, it depends on the quality of the data, it depends how noisy uh, the data is, how noisy the answer is. Typically, you need about a thousand examples. Um, for average problems in machine learning, better uh, cases usually have 10,000 to 100,000 examples. So that's an average problem. If you're trying to do something that's really difficult, like um, text translation or anything that requires deep learning, um, you have to go up by almost another order of magnitude, 100,000 to a million examples. So, you know, thanks to things like next generation sequencing or thanks to the you know, rapid developments in protein structure determination and uh, large numbers of, of known protein sequences, some of these much harder machine learning problems are now solvable because we are in the range of 100,000 to a million examples. So um, I've gone through the first two steps, defining your, your problem, constructing your data set. The next one is to try, try and transform your data set and to select those features. So when you have big data, usually it's, it's pretty messy. There's sometimes repeats, uh, sometimes there's missing value. So your missing values have to be imputed or filled in. Sometimes things have to be reformatted. Um, uh, sometimes you have to identify outliers. Sometimes you have to remove um, sparse classes or group them together into um, groups that are uh, more meaningful. So this is called data cleaning or data cleansing. Another thing that's often done is um, converting categorical or nominal data, things with names, um, to numeric data, because computers read numbers, they don't read names. So this is something called one-hot encoding, um, which we'll hear about in, in um, neural networks. Uh, there are other ways of, of reformatting data. Um, another important thing that many people don't know about or don't realize is that um, a lot of data has to be uh, normalized. Uh, that means making it Gaussian. A lot of biological data is very skewed. And so taking a log transformation or other transformation, uh, range scaling um, helps improve enormously the performance of a machine learning program. So that's called data transformation. Um, Occasionally, you know, you have your data set and you look at it and you say, well, I think you're missing some things here. I'd really like to have that. Um, so in some cases, people will add features to their data set. Sometimes they will calculate ratios. Sometimes if it's sequential data, they'll include the days of the week uh, because there are tendencies that happen during the days of the week, like weekends, people don't work. And so if you're trying to measure mobility or predict mobility um, information, um, knowing the day of the week actually helps a lot. Um, so adding obvious relationships or intuitive expectations to your data set can sometimes make a real difference. Um, another part is uh, feature selection or feature engineering. Um, this is where you either select features or remove irrelevant data. And again, this sometimes is done through the machine learning program. Sometimes it's done through um, 
uh, a person's own intuition. So I've talked about one hot encoding. Uh, this is widely used in machine learning. Uh, it's basically converting categorical or named data, like red, green, blue, uh, into a binary representation. Um, so you can see a table which makes, on the left side, it makes sense to us because we know colors. Um, but we can convert it to a different table um, where now we still have the identification of the objects. Um, but now our, our label uh, is put up in the header for the essentially the rows. And we've just indicated with the one or zero whether the object has a red color or a blue color or a green color. So that makes it much more readable, um, and that's called one-hot encoding. Fixing skewed data, uh, showing essentially some skewed data on the left. Uh, uh, it's not uncommon to see that in image uh, analysis data, microarray data is one example, um, audio data, sound data, often has very skewed distributions. But by um, taking a log of that, skewed data, you can come up with a really nicely looking normalized distribution. And normal distributions of data, of numbers, numeric information is much more easily classified and processed. Feature selection, uh, we talked about this as well. As I said, not all data is relevant. Um, and by reducing the amount of data that's used in training, that can greatly speed up um, the, the algorithms. Some machine learning programs can take literally weeks to finish training. And if you have too much data, uh, it can like, take literally years. Uh, so feature selection is a way of getting rid of uh, those features that contribute the least and adding or keeping those that um, contribute most. Sometimes if you include irrelevant data uh, or just drag that irrelevant data along, it actually reduces the performance of uh, the machine learning model. So, you know, model that has that gets away with the minimum complexity is often the best and, and often the most accurate. So I guess visually, if you can think about feature selection with this, where you've got you know, a whole bunch of, in this case, seven different features in different colors, uh, we choose to get rid of certain numbers of them. And through that, we end up from seven down to three. And that, as I say, can be done automatically. Um, through a variety of programs. It can also be done manually uh, where someone just simply um, uses their intuition or compares performance uh, with different combinations of features. Um, there's plenty of examples where people can basically get away or use too few features. So if you had um, essentially the data on the right but had somehow neglected to include seven or eight points, you would get the data on the left. And of course, if you see two points, the tendency is to draw a line, which is not always correct. So if you have too little data uh, or not enough data, you can come up with uh, potentially the wrong interpretation. So these parts of defining the machine learning problem, constructing your data set, transforming and selecting features, these are actually the most important parts of machine learning. And they're the ones that are typically the most neglected and the ones for reason for most failures in machine learning. The next parts are methodological and we're probably gonna spend a fair bit of time about you know, the different models. Um, but in the end, a lot of machine learning models are, are pretty much equivalent. They, they do about the same. Uh, some do slightly better, some do slightly worse. Uh, you're never going to have one where, you know, something in performance is at 2% and you change to a new model and now it's 99% correct. You're going to get something that maybe predicts 75% with one model and maybe 79% with the other model. They're subtly different and yes, 79 is probably statistically better. Um, but if you have not constructed your data set correctly, if you hadn't transformed it, if you hadn't got your, and selected your features, those are the things that make the difference between a 2% performance and a 99% performance. So it's the back end stuff that's really important. However, it's the front end that I think we'll focus on because that's where I think most people are more curious about. 
So in terms of choosing your model, uh, we've talked about these already, decision trees, random forests, neural nets, hidden Markov models, support vector machines. It, you don't know which model will be best. And many people who are in machine learning will try multiple models. And as I say, usually you'll just see subtle differences between the models. Some are significantly better um, because the model was really designed for something else. Um, so knowing a little bit about what's, what different models are capable of or more suited for certainly helps you avoid wasting time on, on a model that's not really suited to the problem. But these days with machine learning and deep learning, there's typically half a dozen models that'll give you almost equivalent performance. So I mentioned a few of them and I'll just briefly go through them. We'll talk about them in much more detail later. So the decision tree is actually the simplest machine learning algorithm to understand and to implement. And on the right, I'm just showing an example of the survival of passengers on a Titanic. So the Titanic is a giant ship that went down about a hundred years ago. Uh, and the rule of women and children first uh, was what was followed with the Titanic. So most women survived uh, the Titanic. Um, uh, but they also were trying to choose young people. So if you were male and you were sufficiently young, under the age of, it turns out, nine and a half, um, then you had uh, a better chance of survival, but you had an even better chance if there were um, the number of people in your family was sufficiently large. Um, so um, that's sort of a decision tree that was identified or, or learned. And some of the numbers in the, um, less than greater than signs are messed up on this one so we'll correct that but anyways what's happening in uh, machine learning the decision tree is that you have a list and the passenger list of all the people who survived and who didn't survive and their age and their gender and their number of family members um, and the computer then learns to recognize um, which decisions were made by the captain or the crew deciding who lived and who died and so this decision tree is what was learned. Uh, it wasn't applied. The, the captain didn't have this table to decide who, who would go on to a lifeboat and who wouldn't. But this is what was learned afterwards. And the decision about male, female is probably obvious. But you know, what was the cutoff age? Was it nine? Was it 10? Was it 11? Well, it turned out nine and a half. How many siblings and, and spouses? Was it three, four, five? This is what the machine learning decision tree learned. So what you can see is it consists of a series of, it looks like an upside down tree, uh, the roots at the top, uh, and it has uh, branches and uh, the blocks or squares or rectangles are called leaves, the lines are called edges. In random forest, what you do is you combine many decision trees together. Um, and having a combination of decision trees and where you either average or choose majority voting from the different decision trees gives you uh, a final result. So random forest is a step up where you've got instead of one decision tree, you've got multiple decision trees that the computer has learned. They're combined because you're combining them. It's called an ensemble method for learning. Um, and you can use it for both classification, but you can also use it for things like curve fitting or regression. Um, and the concept with random forest is that decision or prediction by committee is usually more accurate than a single uh, tree. And, and that's true. It's sometimes called meta prediction or metacritics and so on. Artificial neural nets are another area that we're going to focus on. And these are really the precursor for deep neural nets and deep learning. Artificial neural nets are really cool because they try and simulate the activity of the brain. And the brain is a pretty good engine for doing pattern recognition. Um, we have typically with an artificial neural net, we have nodes, those are the circles. Uh, those nodes um, sort of represent neurons and then the lines are connections or weight matrices. And those represent sort of the axons extending from the neurons. Like uh, decision trees and, and, and random forests, artificial neural nets can be used for classifying, but they can also be used for regression or uh, linear, nonlinear correlation. Hidden Markov models or HMMs, these are called probabilistic graphical models. 
and they're designed to, to model sequences, um, connections of events, um, time, if you want. Um, they uh, are Markovian, uh, which is a process um, essentially trying to model ones that can't be observed, which is why you come up with the word hidden um, Markov model. It's a probabilistic one where you have what are called emission and transition probabilities. And the probabilities they're attached, which I guess you can think of them as weights, not unlike with a neural net, um, they have to be optimized. And the optimization is done through dynamic programming, which some of you might know is commonly used in sequence alignment. Hidden Markov models um, are, are sort of losing popularity because you can now get the same performance or even better with things like long short-term neural nets or LSTMs. Um, but uh, the hidden Markov model is important for historical reasons because it's useful for predicting time events, things that occur over time. So that when you speak, you produce sound that has um, that varies over time. Uh, if you're looking at the stock market as it goes up and down, this is a value of the stock uh, over time. If you're looking at DNA or protein data, um, those are collections of letters that um, essentially sequential, um, maybe not in time, but in order. So sequential events or sequential data or temporal data is best handled through hidden Markov models. Uh, support vector machines. Uh, I think it's got a, one of the dumbest names. Um, they are not machines, they are algorithms. And essentially it's a way of, of doing linear discriminant analysis. It's, it's a form of, again, regression. Uh, the trick with support vector machines is to use kernel transformations or kernel tricks where you transform the data to find an optimal boundary between a hyperplane. It's essentially a form of partial least squares discriminant analysis, if any of you know about um, multivariate statistics. But it's sort of bending, transforming the data to find an optimal way of separating it. Um, we aren't going to talk about SVMs uh, in this workshop just because there's not enough time. So once you've chosen any one of these models for classifying, uh, for regressing, uh, for predicting, um, the, um, you have initially had to train it. Uh, and typically, we've talked about the amount of data that you typically need to train it with. And then you have to test or validate the model. Um, so when you're doing um, machine learning or when you're doing classification of any time, any form, you have to ensure that your model is not overtrained. Um, you don't want to underfit by using too few parameters and you don't want to overfit by using too many parameters. In the bottom, I'm showing sort of examples where you've got some data and we're, if you want, regressing. Um, so the orange dots, um, we're trying to fit there. So if we do an underfit, we would just draw a straight line and say, well, that kind of works. Um, if we did an overfit, we'd essentially try and connect every single dot to the other. And so we get the squiggly line. So on the right, it's overfitting. On the left, it's underfitting. In the middle, which is sort of slightly parabolic, it's sort of crosses all the way through between those points. Um, so if, if you underfit or overfit, um, the model isn't good for predicting new data. Uh, you tend to underestimate the error. If the model is too elaborate, um, it essentially starts modeling noise. And so that also makes it particularly sensitive to the input data set. So the testing and validation essentially allows you to, to sort of calibrate and make sure that you're not overfitting or underfitting. And that's a bit of an iterative process and people will have to spend sometimes a few days, sometimes even a few weeks, just making sure that they haven't overtrained or undertrained. And the overtraining, undertraining is very much a function of your data set. The most common mistake that people tend to make with machine learning or with classification tools and multivariate statistics um, is overfitting. Uh, it's, it's using too many parameters. Um, and uh, so underfitting is rare, overfitting is common. 
and many people report spectacular results because they didn't um, really test or validate their data. They trained on their training set and they tested on their training set. So that's kind of like taking a test, getting the answer key, and then taking the test again and saying, aren't I smart? Um, I know the, the stuff. So, you know, it's not really a measure of your knowledge, especially if someone's given you the answers for the test. Um, so to prevent this overtraining, um, there's lots of needs to use uh, external validation sets, um, to use uh, n-fold or k-fold cross-validation, to use leave one out or permutation or all four methods. So one way of making sure that you, you don't fall into this trap of overfitting is to take your data and to split it into two groups. So if you were an experimentalist and you've spent you know, half your life collecting this data set, um, you don't wanna have someone tell you, well, spend the other half of your life collecting uh, another data set. So that can be your holdout or your validation set. No, take your data that you already collected and split it. And the split typically is sort of two thirds, one third. Two thirds of your data is used to train to get the model um, up to speed. And then one third of the data, which is called a holdout data set, um, is used to assess the model. Now that, that test data can't be used in the training set. It has to be invisible, it has to be kept away. So it's only at the end of the training that you're allowed to do the testing. Um, now, sometimes it's um, this, one third, two thirds approach is not ideal. It may be a function of the data size or the, the way that things are, are breaking out uh, in terms of being unevenly distributed. So you can do something instead called k-fold or n-fold cross-validation. And so maybe instead of splitting into two, you can split it into three or four or 10. So this is a three-fold cross-validation where we have three rounds of testing and training. So in this case, we take two thirds uh, in blue and one third on the right, which is our test set. Then we scramble it and then we train on the stuff on the right and keep the stuff on the left as our test set. Or we keep the middle in red as our test set. And so this way we can essentially um, train um, and test a little more rigorously and ensure that our model has not been overfitted. Ideally, what we should get in, in all three results is a similar performance on our test and our training set. If not, then essentially the model needs to be tweaked again through part of this uh, in-fold training process. You can go even further. So if we have our data set, um, but in this case, we train on everything except for one, and then we test on that one. And then we shift over and say, well, if the first one was what going to be our test one, then we'll say the second one now will be our test. And then our third one. And if you've got a, you know, 10 million, then you're going to have essentially 10 million iterations of this leave one out validation. Um, that's not done very much anymore, but it is a method uh, that has historically been used. Permutation testing is another approach where you take your data um, and it's got the cold gold standard um, answer. So it's, it's been labeled, one's in red, one's in blue. Um, and then you run your labeled data and, and hopefully your machine learning tool separates it or classifies it. Um, and if that robustly separates or classifies as we've seen in the upper right corner, then what you do is you randomly permute the data. You relabel things. So if something was labeled green, now you label it blue. And if it was blue, now you label it green and, and randomly um, mess it up basically. So if you've got your messed up data, which is down at the bottom called the permuted data, and then you run it through your machine learner, um, which has already learned the patterns, uh, it should also mess things up. It won't be able to classify. So you can repeatedly permute your data and repeatedly randomize it and repeatedly run it through your machine learning learner. And if the machine learning learner still can't separate things, um, that's actually a good sign because it, sh it shows you that the machine learner 
uh, has learned to separate the real data. It's learned the pattern. It hasn't found noise and it's not overfitting. So you can calculate your separation score and plot it out, which is shown on the left side. And um, where the arrow highlights is this distribution in terms of your separation score. And if you've got something that's well separated from the pack, then you can say that through permutation testing, I know that my machine learned model is very robust and you can actually get a statistical value in terms of significance. Another way of assessing machine learning models is to use a confusion matrix. We're going to use this a lot. Uh, and this is assessing whether something was correct or incorrect, a true positive or true negative, also false positives and false negatives. Um, so typically we're comparing between what's observed and what's predicted. Um, that's a common thing that we do in machine learning. And so this four by four table um, is identifying. So if something that you predict is true is actually true, that's a true positive. Something that you predicted uh, as um, uh, negative and is, is shown to be negative, that's a true negative. But if the positive and negative are different, then you can either have a false negative or a false positive. Combinations of these four, true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative, it gives you sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is the true positive rate, specificity is the true negative rate. So typically in, in living systems, biological systems, they follow sort of a distribution. Um, so there might be something that's in blue is the diseased group and orange is the healthy group. Um, but there's a distribution in their phenotypes or in their body temperature or whatever that you're measuring. And so that distribution is shown here and they will overlap. They're not typically so distinct that they, they don't overlap. It's those overlaps that produces the false positives and the false negatives. It's the non-overlapped regions, which are the true positives and the true negatives. And then in the bottom, I've given you the definition of what sensitivity or SN and specificity SP is. So when we're comparing sensitivity and specificity, true positive, false positive, we often calculate what's called a receiver operating characteristic curve or rock curve. That's been around since the 40s. It was introduced when they were doing radar analysis of German bombers uh, bombing uh, the UK, and they were assessing the performance of the radar stations. Um, but rock curves have now moved on and they're widely used in biomedical applications to assess the performance of classifiers, to look at biomarker models. And what a rock curve is, it plots the true positive rate against the false positive rate for some kind of binary classifier, so predicted versus mm -hmm. observed, as the cutoff point is varied. So this is an example of a receiver operating characteristic curve. It's this brownish curve, and these are points where we're plotting on the bottom is the specificity or one minus specificity and then on the y-axis the sensitivity. And although you can't see it very well and this normally would be animated, um, there are different cutoffs as we move these orange and yellow and green and blue lines across uh, the distribution to see where things are um, um, most optimal in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So if we cut off here we're way down in this range uh, with very low um, false positive rate and a low uh, true positive rate up here, which is optimal. And I think that's somewhere around here. Um, we get the best separation or maybe here is the best overall performance. So we can assess the quality of a predictor or a separator or a classifier by looking at the area under the rock curve. Uh, so AUC. And it's how we sometimes measure biomarkers or performance for tests. A random test, a random bar biomarker would have uh, an area under the curve of 50%. That's a coin flip. It's random. A perfect test that predicts um, whether someone, say, has cancer or not um, would have an area under the curve of 100%. Um, most biomarkers that are used in medicine have an area under the curve of about 70%, which is normally classified as a poor test. But some of the better ones that are being developed with multi-component analyses using machine learning uh, have area under the curves of, of 90% or better. 
those are very useful, very valuable tests. So after you have got your data, constructed your data, transformed your data, chosen your model, trained your model, tested your model, and validated your model, it's now ready for its um, Broadway debut. Um, you can now take it out and, and, and use it to make predictions or perform classifications. Um, it has to have passed all the training and testing phases, but once it's done that, then you can have some good confidence and you can publish it or use it or explain it however you want to do. And this is an example of a, a model where we've predicted, uh, in this case, um, um, random or uh, mass spec data uh, using a hidden Markov model that also incorporates artificial neural nets. And um, this has been thoroughly tested, thoroughly trained, thoroughly validated. And in the course of doing it, we put it on uh, as a web server. And so that's another way of, of putting out your model out there uh, so that people can use it. So I think we're kind of wrapping up for this, this phase of the course uh, or this module. Um, so I, I wanted to introduce you and, and over the next two days, we'll introduce you to decision trees and artificial neural nets. That's our focus for today. And then hidden Markov models uh, tomorrow. We're gonna apply them to three bioinformatics problems. One for a general classification, which you can do for just about anything in biology. Then we're gonna do something in secondary structure prediction. And then we're gonna do one for gene finding. Now these are not really advanced in the sense that um, these are techniques that have been developed many years ago through machine learning, but this is a good way for getting you started. And you can apply the same concepts to some of your own problems and your own interests. Uh, we're going to use um, uh, Python and we're gonna use a tool called Google Colab. Um, and we're gonna go do a deep dive into the algorithms and the code. And this I think is unique to this course. Um, and the concept here is it's sort of helping you understand what an engine is and what the wheels are and what the transmission are in your car. It helps to understand a little bit about your car before you drive it. If you just treat your car as a black box, um, you're gonna have problems. And so we want you to understand a little bit. We don't want you to be able to pull your engine apart and put it back and become a mechanic, but we do want you to sort of understand the concepts and why these things work and why they don't work. Now, after doing the deep dive into some of the messy code that's involved in machine learning, we're gonna kind of come up for air and show how you can do uh, the same things using uh, Keras and Scikit-Learn, which simplify a lot of the more difficult elements of the coding for neural nets, hidden Markov models, and decision trees into simple function calls. So, it's sort of, you know, you've graduated, now you know how your car works, now you just have to put the keys in and press go. Um, that's what sort of Keras and Scikit learn, and it's allowed people who may not have really the strongest mathematical background or computing background to actually do some pretty impressive work in machine learning. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on tomorrow, um, is, is introducing you to Keras and Scikit-Learn after we've tortured you with looking at the actual code inside uh, those modules. So that's the, the end of uh, module one. Um, I'm looking at our time here. How are we doing? We're good. Um, we're a bit early on the schedule, but we started, so you're about like sort of right on time. Okay. Um, so now maybe uh, I'm going to stop sharing and I just want to ask a question to the group, um, which is how many of you have completed the pre-reading uh, material? If you can just go to the reactions and put up uh, the yes, um, if you have. Um, so again, just go to reactions. I just want to make sure. Um, now, is it looks like there's a few of you who haven't, and I think this is important. Um, so what we can do, uh, I'm, and I'm going to go back to sharing the screen.
is uh, we'll, we'll do this separately or we can go off with the TAs um, for some of you who are uh, still challenged. But this is really to introduce you to Google Colab. So I'm just going to race through this. I'm not going to spend any time, but this is the environment we're going to be using. And in order to use Google Colab, you have to have a Google account. You need to have Google Drive. Um, it means now by working through Google Colab, you don't have to download Python or download R and install it, uh, which can be a problem for certain computers. This just shows you how to set up a Google account. I'm not going to go through it specifically, but these are the slides that if you haven't set up your Google account, then this is what you should do. Um, Race through that. And then through um, Google, you can access Colab or the Colaboratory. There's a little video there that you can watch. Um, it's run similar to what's called a Jupyter notebook. Uh, some of you might have heard of Jupyter, some of you actually might use it. Um, it allows you to do online editing, viewing, inserting. Um, if you've ever used Google Docs, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, it allows you to combine code. You can write things, you can put in images, you can put in HTML. So these notebooks are actually pretty impressive. Um, so this just shows you how to go into your Google Drive. Um, also shows you how to download the folder into your computer, how to, unzip, well, you need to unzip it. Um, these are the folders. Again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. So again, if you haven't done this, you need to do this during the break. Um, and then also how to install the Colab app um, um, and add it to your Google suite, installing it, how to open a Colab file, uh, the main page, and then opening your first Colab notebook. Um, and this just shows you how, how to start, uh, step one, step two with editing, uh, changing the name of the notebook, uh, sort of by clicking and putting your name in, in there, and then how to code, uh, which is just an example of the hello world for Python. Um, once you've entered the code, then you can run it by pressing the little arrow, which is the run cell, and it produces some output. Um, we also show you how to upload data in terms of sometimes you need data sets uh, to be able to run the programs that we're showing you. Um, and this also shows how to upload the data. You have to sort of click on a file folder, which would have that data set, um, upload the file with the icon there um, to select the data files. Um, and you can also do drag and drop if, if necessary. Uh, you can run uh, all of the different cells. So many of the code sets or snippets are broken down into cells, but you can run all of them to run the complete program. So at this stage, as I say, I raced through this. Um, all of you, hopefully most of you will have gone through those before and will have had some success. If you haven't, we'll have time during the break or after this to make sure everyone's up to speed. I just wanted to introduce very briefly um, NumPy. NumPy, so it's a Python library to handle uh, arrays or matrices or tables. It also has some higher level mathematical functions. And those table functions and or array functions, dot product type things, uh, higher level math functions are really, really useful. And so this is why we use NumPy in a number of our programs. And then pandas um, is also used for data manipulation, and it's particularly useful for handling data in comma-separated variable or Excel format or text format. Um, and it allows you to convert uh, into a data frame, so we have rows and columns. And rows and columns are tables slash matrices, and we use rows and columns a lot in, in machine learning and obviously in bioinformatics. I mentioned as well that um, you can do machine learning in R, and I know a number of you are uh, more comfortable in R. Uh, what we're doing in this course, as I say, is we're, we're guiding you through it in, in Python, uh, but the equivalent code is available in R. It's, it's annotated in the same way. 
Um, and those of you who are sort of bilingual, you'll see some useful similarities between Python and R. Um, and with the CoLab, they have uh, R Studio um, that allows you to do it. Um, different languages, some are faster. As a rule, Python is faster than R in terms of its runtime. Um, and this is just how to start a CoLab uh, in R. You'll also find in the student uh, repository, student pages, uh, you can click on the hyperlink or the one that's given here. Uh, as you scroll down, uh, you'll see in our labs where we've got the Python code, the R code and the data collections. Uh, by clicking on those links, um, you can uh, open up uh, specific modules. So for module one, we don't have any coding because that was just an introduction. Module two, we will have the code. Um, as you'll learn tomorrow, uh, there's a lot of other tools that allow you to avoid some of the complications of the coding um, that we'll show you. But whether it's scikit-learn and Keras, these are the ones that we will talk about um, for machine learning programming. Um, there's TensorFlow, Azure ML, PyTorch and Torch, Weka and Moa. These are all essentially tools that people are using to sort of become pretty competent machine learning uh, specialists um, allow you to do the complicated coding that um, uh, by just sort of dragging and dropping or calling up uh, specific functions. Um, we'll, we'll show you how it simplifies um, things like decision trees and neural nets and hidden Markov models, but it's important to also understand how those models work. So to wrap up, uh, machine learning is a method to thought programs or algorithms automatically. It's great for pattern finding, fitting, and prediction, but it needs large data sets. There are different models, which we'll talk about, decision trees, neural nets, and Markov models. Um, we won't get to all of them. Uh, I think we've shown you how it can be used in many, day, many everyday applications, and certainly through uh, some of the tools like Keras, Scikit-learn, and others, it's becoming much more accessible and much easier to use. Um, I think I've given you some examples of machine learning and bioinformatics. Deep learning is an extension of machine learning um, and is now being used more and more. And uh, it's quite impressive in what it's able to do. Uh, the deep learning applications are starting to appear in the area of genomics, bioinformatics, cheminformatics. Um, and it's really, in some cases, only limited by, by your ideas uh, or the access to data that you have to, to really come up with some compelling new machine learning applications. Now, there's also something to know about, um, in addition to machine learning, there's another field of statistics called multivariate statistics. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with things like principal component analysis, hierarchical clustering, partial least squares discriminant analysis, um, logistic regression or linear regression. Um, all of these techniques actually are sort of precursors to modern machine learning. And in some cases they can do just as well. Um, so uh, principal component analysis does unsupervised clustering or unsupervised learning. PLSDA does supervised learning or classification and PLSDA can do just as well as neural nets in some cases. Linear and logistic regression can perform just as well as neural net regression, and SVM regression. So these are some caveats. And so that if you've heard of or have used multivariate statistics and have heard of things like PCLA or PLSDA, in essence, you're kind of already doing it, but it's, it's more statistically based. And it sort of underlines the statistical basis to machine learning, that they, they are um, almost one in the same. <clears throat> 